quite visibly on a, on a moral landscape where there, there are peaks and valleys and, and uh, not all directions are equivalent and not all cultures are, are located. Not all cultures, not all subcultures are located in the same place on, a, on that moral landscape. Um, and that this, is, this is, to my eye, moral realism. This is, this is right and wrong answers to moral questions. Um, and the, the right and wrong answers, whether or not we can always find them in every context. I mean, I'm not suggesting this is not a utopian view where we're going to have a machine that you know turn the dial and we'll know whether or not uh, uh, democracy, as practiced by the United States in the year 2017, is exactly the optimal political system. But there, there'll be certain criteria that will no longer be up for grabs, um, and. Anyway, I mean, that's, that's the general area I'm thinking in. I, I, I seem to remember, um, I think Paul Churchland in The Engine of Reason, The Seat of the Soul, mm -hmm. has some nice descriptions of how these things can be thought about in terms of landscapes like that. So that's, that's an interesting connection there. I, I, um, although many of the sessions that we'll be dealing with deal with things like fMRI, the neural underpinnings, as best as we can understand them, of economic decisions, trust, um, all those sorts of things as well, right. law, uh, how that, th th there was nevertheless going to be, a, it's, it's a hard row here in, for, for, for most people in the sense that they, they, see, they see this initially as being immensely reductionistic mm -hmm. and dehumanizing. Right. I actually think it's enlarging. To, to think in these ways, to, and to have some sort of evidence like that, which, which underpins what you, what you, your, your folk psychological understanding of things. But right. Don't you find that that it's a, it's a hard sell? Uh, yeah, well, it, this whole issue of, of what is dehumanizing, I think, is it deserves some unpacking because it's not. W w if you reduce <laughs> enough, you see that your your boundaries are are fluid. I mean, you're not. It's not. You don't get reduced to a point where uh, you are diminished. You, are re you get reduced to a point where you are permeable to the rest of, of the culture and the rest of, I mean, your mind in some sense isn't just what your brain is doing. Um, I mean, there are many examples uh, of this, but uh, I mean, just you, you take, for instance, you know, I forget which philosopher pointed this out, but somebody's accent, your accent, you know, your speech accent. It, to, to explain that phenomenon, you can't really explain it at the level of, of your brain. Uh, you can't really explain it just at the level of your personal experience. I mean, it, it is the consequence of your embeddedness in a culture. Uh, it was brought, it was, it was imported into you as a system. Uh, and there's so much about what we do, uh, so much about our minds, so much about the, the, uh, what we what we feel as meaning and value uh, that that is a result of our entanglement with others. It's, so it's it's not that it's not that if we understood ourselves uh, uh, perfectly at the level of the brain, the result would be a total diminishment in in uh, uh, our view of ourselves as as uh, wondrous uh, and wondrously made. I mean, I think it would it would be. Um, in some sense, it exalts our circumstance, and it would give us whatever is true about us. Ultimately, it would give us a power to to change our circumstance in ways that that uh, benefit us. I mean, we you know people want to be happier, people want to be uh, less burdened by unnecessary psychological suffering. How can we bring that about? Is is delusion the only remedy? Uh, it's a, de delusion has its place. I mean, delusion actually works for some people some of the time, but it actually, it's not, it is a fragile remedy. You know, reality intrudes, and then your delusions are, are no longer helping you. And so it seems to me that, that we're continually going to be in a better position to figure out how to be happy together and to, figure, and, and to see that our collaboration with one another is not zero sum. I mean, it's not like my happiness is predicated on your losing happiness. Um, for the most part, as human beings, our happiness is predicated on, on us recognizing more and more of the time that we have a common project. Uh, and 
it seems to me that one of the challenges of science is to figure out how to uh, to focus us on the, on that common project with the least amount of friction, with the least amount of of unnecessary, divisive, sectarian um, uh, loss of resources, essentially. And when you look at the difference between science and religion and the way they break down or fail to break down uh, boundaries between people, uh, I mean, science is, is the greatest uh, uh, force for the removal of conversational barriers we have ever hit upon. I mean, is, there is no such thing as American science versus Japanese science. There's no such thing as Jewish science versus Hindu science. I mean, there, there is, there is, there's just science. Um, and uh, there ha at some level, that, that has to be true of ideas generally. It has to be true of the ideas that, that uh, cash out our, our moral intuitions and um, uh, our deepest goals in life. So what's the, the mission statement of the Reason Project, which you're just having just in a well, really briefly? Yeah, it really is along these lines. It's, it's yeah. the goal is to spread uh, secular thinking and scientific knowledge in society and to do that in a very multidisciplinary way. I mean, and to do it in, in terms of organizing conferences and, and, and uh, funding scientific research, but also to create uh, documentaries and, and uh, media events. Um, and we have a very diverse board from, from scientists like Steven Weinberg to entertainers like, like Bill Maher and, and uh, writers like Ian McEwan and Salman Rushdie. I mean, I, my, my image is this is a problem of, of transforming the way people think about uh, the human project. and, and uh, transforming the, the kind of expectations we have of our neighbors uh, uh, for making sense in public discourse. And so I, I see a role for um, business and, and uh, entertainment and also you know, hard you know, laboratory scholarship to come at this from all angles because we, we all have to start talking the talk uh, from all sides very quickly here, it seems to me. So what, what, what are the most... Um salient mistakes you've made and what did you learn from them? Well, I didn't learn much because one salient mistake was to talk about MDMA in an interview. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I had an interview with the, um, the LA Times and it was on track to be a, you know, your standard interview and, and the mention of MDMA became, uh, it became the atheist has mi his mind blown on MDMA interview. Right. Uh, so don't do that again. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, I'm glad you glad yes, you avoided you doing can, that yeah, again. You can see. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it's I mean, it's going it's going well. I mean, there's many things I would I would probably I could rethink, but uh, I'm very grateful for how it has unfolded. And I've you know I I feel like I've done everything in the wrong order. You know, I I I've. Um, you know, I published two books before I finished my PhD, and I mean, it's, it's sort of, it's a weird, you know, I'm in a that's, weird that's position. That's what your advisor yeah. said to yeah. me as well. <laughs> right, you know. Um, so, you know, there's, there's clearly a better way to, uh, and a more efficient way to do some of these things, but it's, uh, I can't really complain. Yeah. On, on the MDMA thing, uh, it's this is also, why you don't bring it's, it up. It's also, it's, I think it's also the case that I mean, there's an awful lot of people who are very grateful to Sasha Shulgin for actually synthesizing yeah, that as well. Yeah. Um, who would you have liked to have had a conversation with? Anybody from history, anywhere, anytime? Who? Um, well, I mean, just out of curiosity's sake, I would have to pick some of these religious patriarchs. I mean, I would have to say Jesus would be on my short list just to see what <laughs> all the fuss was about. Um, You'd like to have a last supper with Jesus? Yeah, I think you know he would. He would make the top five certainly. Yeah. Um, Maybe Samuel Johnson. Um, I guess Newton. I would tr probably try to thrash some of his theology out of him. Um, I mean, that's one of the paradoxes. I mean, Newton, the prototypical uh, genius uh, above all uh, other geniuses, uh, 
certainly squandered a third of his intellectual energy on things that, that many of his contemporaries could see uh, to be bogus. So it's an interesting case study in the, in the partitioning of, of reason in some sense. Yeah. Um, I usually ask people who's the, who's the smartest person you know and who's the wisest person you know. Um, that is, smartest is difficult because uh, I, I see, I mean, again, Newton is, is the great example. You see so many smart people uh, who are smart in the quintessentially uh, smart ways that, that we all value in science, the, certainly quantitatively smart, who believe in the unbelievable. I mean, you, you just have to debate a few physicists and astronomers on the virgin birth of Jesus and to see that something, you know, something about Howard Gardner's thesis of multiple intelligences is, is, has got to be true. Um, so I don't really have one, one person. Uh, I mean, for, wisdom for me is quite a different thing. Uh, and this is it's actually born of my experience in, in meditation and studying with, with some of these great meditation masters because it, it seems to me that, that wisdom is a separable uh, psychological trait that, is, that need not imply uh, smarts in any, in any other sense. I mean, you know, there's nothing about spending 20 years in a cave meditating uh, and developing your, your experience of compassion uh, that equips you to have conversations like we have at, at this meeting or gives you the, the slightest inkling about the scientific worldview. But there's something about it. wisdom for me is is um, an ability to no longer suffer unnecessarily. I mean, to really to be, that you have your priorities straight emotionally in such a way that you really are your attention is free, not to be a schmuck. You know, you're not you're not neurotic. You're not worried what people are thinking about you. You're not. I mean, there's there's some there's a kind of groundedness in just your witnessing of the flow of your experience. Uh, which is liberating, and, and very few people have it to um, to a, a degree that's that's uh, salient. But you meet some of these guys who have spent 20 years in a cave meditating, and they're they they weren't just wasting their time. I mean, it's, you know, we may there may be a much more efficient way of getting what they got. Uh, let's hope. Uh, but you know, someone. I mean, the Dalai Lama isn't even. I mean, I'm talking about the, the kinds of people he would go to to learn how to meditate. I mean, but you know, he also strikes me as someone who's remarkably wise in his uh, in this way. I mean, when you follow him on his schedule, where he's he's got it parsed out in you know seven minute increments, and uh, he's been up since four in the morning, uh, and you see a, a kind of flexibility of of uh, uh, mind that you know. I have for about five minutes on my best day, and you know the full armamentarium of uh, Sasha Shulgin was was required to get me there. You know, um, uh, it overstates it slightly, but it's it's. Uh, uh, I mean, I think wisdom is hard hard won and need not entail smarts. One last thing, because they were apparently we're about to run out of tape, which w would be as follows, which is. Um, in January next year, you will become a father, mm -hmm. so you have an investment in the future. So I assume you're optimistic about something in this. Um, what are you optimistic yeah, about? Yeah, maybe I should have thought about that more. Um, I can't say I'm optimistic. I mean, I, I've never been convicted of optimism. Um, I'm just, you know, I, I don't see what else to do in terms of, I mean, none of my efforts are predicated on a sense that the, the battle is about to be won. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, there's, there is something about having a child which, or deciding to have a child, which I think forces a, um, who was it, Bacon, who said, you know, you, you give hostage, hostage to fortune. Hostages to fortune. The, yeah. to fortune. Um, and I, you know, I feel that very deeply, that you, you, you are implicated in uh, history in a way that you weren't a moment ago. Um, and that seems to me to be a good thing. I mean, I think it, uh, you know, we, should, we should all be all in uh, because uh, it matters. You know? um, so I'm looking forward to, to worrying more and having more reasons to worry. <laughs> Sam Harris, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you.